everybody welcome um i'm just gonna give it another minute and then we will get started Alrighty, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Oh wait, there are a few more people I'm going to let into the waiting room. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Josie, I use she, her pronouns, and I will be your MC this evening. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to go over some norms. First, please mute yourself if you are not talking. Um, and introduce yourself in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and put the link in here. Um, let us know your name, pronouns, partner organization, and what territory you are on. So again, my name is Josie. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I work at the Center for Common Ground, a partner organization. And I currently am on occupied Lenape territory, which is also known as Brooklyn, New York. Um, we love the chat, so please use it, ask questions, um, just add some plus signs if you like something that somebody is saying. Um, please don't multitask, please uh, stay mentally present. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things to share with you this evening. And of course, be positive, be kind, be patient and have fun. I hope you all learn some new things tonight. All right, we can go ahead to the next slide and get started. So as you, probably already know, but tonight we are going to be talking a little bit about what our legislative priorities are as a coalition for the upcoming 2022 session. 
We're going to also be um, introducing the new Virginia Economy Act and talking a little bit about what you can do now and in um, January once session starts to help us get some important bills um, through this 2022 session. We have some great speakers here this evening to help uh, talk about these priorities with us. Um, first, we will hear from Kendall Crawford, Crawford the co-director of the Virginia Interfaith Power and Light. We're going to hear from Matt Royer, the co-chair of the Virginia Justice Dems and our wonderful Sustainable Jobs Working Group Chair. We'll be hearing from Richard Walker, founder of Bridging the Gap Virginia, Stacy Lovelace, um, chair of our Deer Working Group, and Delegate Sam Rasool as well. Um, but before we introduce our first speaker officially, I'm just going to quickly go over who we are, who the Green New Deal Virginia Coalition is, um, and what we are about. If I can get the next slide, please. So we are a coalition of over 80 organizations and businesses really focused on creating thousands of good jobs while also addressing the urgent climate crisis that we as a country are facing, as a, sorry, as a world are facing, um, but in a way that you know, addresses inequities in the state, works to restore our environment and has a just transition to renewable energy from fossil fuels. Um, we have five pillars that we follow to build these, these goals. Uh, one is just an equitable transition. So no workers are to be left behind as we transition to renewable energy. We wanna prioritize clean air and water for all Virginians, have large investments in job training programs in renewable energy and local scale agriculture, as well as um, prioritizing housing and transportation. Okay, well, I guess we'll get started. Um, I'm really excited again to introduce Kendall Crawford, the co-director of the Virginia Interfaith and Power, Interfaith Power and Light organization. Welcome, thank you for being here tonight. I don't know if Kendall has a slide. No, no, I was just gonna, gonna talk. <laughs> Um, hi everyone. Um, again, my name is Kendall Crawford. I am uh, so excited to talk about some of the environmental justice protections in the Green New Deal Climate Action Plan. Um, so as was just said, we all know that Green New Deal Virginia um, has a vision really to try to readjust and redirect our economic governance towards a green and just economy. Um, together, we're envisioning a democratic approach to the climate crisis based on expansive public investments to accelerate and democratize a green transition and decarbonize Virginia economies while eliminating social inequalities. Um, and so to kind of focus on some of those environmental justice protections in um, our climate action plan. Um, and kind of with all of this that you're going to hear, you know, things are still getting finalized. So um, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, a quick reminder um, that currently in Virginia code, um, a, environmental justice means the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of every person, regardless of race, color, national origin, income, faith, or disability, regarding the development, implementation, or enforcement of an environmental law, regulation, or policy. Um, so, you know, thinking about that, again, you know, this means that everybody has a seat at the table um, and everybody is a part of these decisions that uh, make having a clean environment for all of us possible. So remember that definition of environmental justice, a uh, second definition, environmental justice community. So this is defined in Virginia code um, as meaning any low income community or community of color. Um, so just keep those two um, definitions in your mind as I kind of go through some of the environmental justice protections, EJ protections um, in that we are looking to achieve. So um, the bill would, would create a climate action plan. Um, and the exciting thing about this climate action plan is that um, it would be required to support the development of community and publicly owned clean energy, as well as incorporate goals of environmental justice um, and so this climate action plan would be developed with meaningful input and analysis from environmental justice organizations and communities. 
Um, it would also establish a statewide environmental and climate justice task force. Um, so the really exciting thing about this task force is that um, it would encompass uh, members from labor unions, um, of course, like nonprofits, um, environmental justice organizations, um, fossil fuel transition communities, public interest groups, um, and of course, uh, tribal and indigenous communities. Um, and so all of these folks would come together as a part of this task force um, and make recommendations on how Virginia can um, have a just transition to 100% renewable energy and develop that climate um, action plan. Um, so the bill also has a number of environmental justice protections. Um, so there's like six of them. So I hope you all can hang with me. I'll kind of try to go quickly um, through all of them. Uh, so the first one, um, it mandates that a large portion of funds to go to um, both energy efficiency programs um, and clean energy investments in environmental justice communities. And this would keep happening until like all of the electricity used in those communities is clean energy. So that's really exciting. Um, as well, the benefits of these energy efficiency programs, um, those would be directed towards EJ communities, as well as elderly, the elderly, disabled individuals, um, and veterans. So that's the first uh, big, per, big per EJ protection. The second one um, concerns jobs. So the bill would establish job programs for EJ communities. Um, and it would do this in three ways. So it would provide scholarships and low interest loans for job training programs. It would also ensure that these job training programs actually meet the employment needs of each community, because um, it wouldn't make sense to have scholarships and then not to have any job training programs in the community. Um, and then the last uh, reason why this would help um, kind of bolster jobs is that it also would require that 50% of the workforce for energy efficiency and clean energy programs actually comes from um, environmental justice communities. So that's kind of the first two pieces. So we had um, mandates and then we had jobs. The next exciting thing that this um, bill does to protect environmental justice is that it would require meaningful, <clears throat> excuse me, meaningful public input. Um, so this part of the bill um, gets the uh, already codified Environmental Justice Council involved um, on energy transition planning. Um, it would also create statewide and regional bodies all across the state uh, that would focus on um, you know, giving feedback on EJ priorities. Um, this part of the bill also would require that multiple public hearings are held to give input on uh, this transition plan to 100% uh, clean energy economy. Um, so we just went through mandates, jobs, meaningful public input. Now we'll finish with the last few. Um, benefits, so easy, simple, um, this bill ensures that there are realized benefits for low-income communities. Accountability. Um, this bill also makes sure that there is accountability. So what does that look like? Annual reporting. Uh, it also looks like increased shareholder liability for failure to meet goals. Um, and also in the case that goals are not met, it would require um, another plan plan to be developed as to how uh, we're going to get back and on track. And then just finishing up here, last, the last, but one of the last items is permitting. <laughs> permitting. So permitting is really, really important. We all know this. Um, and so the bill would require Virginia permitting agencies to require a cumulative impact analysis. And so uh, the reason why a cumulative impact analysis is uh, vital is because oftentimes communities aren't just dealing with one pollution source. Um, many times it's it's two or three or more um, all happening, um, all polluting in a small area. So um, in terms of permitting, um, it re would require a cumulative impact analysis or a reasonable certainty of no harm to the health of the general population before issuing permits. And so that is a really big uh, game changer for our state. Um, also, in terms of permitting, it would establish an agency-wide environmental justice strategy that addresses adverse health and environmental impacts, and it would require agency employees, so just employees of our state agencies, to complete an EJ training program. So I think, <laughs> sorry, I kind of sped through that. I was trying to be quick. 
Um, but it probably uh, from, from all of that coming at you real quick, um, you got the message that there are a lot of environmental justice protections in the bill. Um, and so I will uh, thank you for listening and I'll pass it over to Matt for information on the labor protections. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Matt Royer. I am based here in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, um, and I'm the chair of the uh, Sustainable Jobs Working Group. Um, so really what we want to be focused on is not only being focused on ensuring the creation of these renewable jobs, uh, but ensuring that they're good paying union jobs uh, that meet or exceed the pay and benefits of the fossil fuel jobs that they would be. Uh, replacing. So that means ensuring a just transition between old energy jobs and future sustainable energy jobs. Uh, we had begun that process of training uh, workers to transition over to the renewable energy sector um, in years past. However, the empty promises of the prior presidential administration deterred them from doing so. Um, as we have seen with those failed promises to the coal and oil industries about jobs being more created, um, jobs have been obliterated and um, plants have been closing down and people have been losing jobs in some of those regions that once were really heavily reliant on fossil fuels to create those jobs. Um, but we can create a sustainable career path for these workers by creating these renewable energy jobs to be good union jobs. So the first step with that starts with repealing our so-called right to work laws here. In uh, Virginia, um, the Virginia, I mean, Virginia has been improving in our rankings for workers in the United States over the past couple of years, which has been great. However, the so-called right to work laws here in Virginia still create an incredibly hostile environment for workers' rights. Uh, according to the Economic Policy Institute, wages in right to work states are about 3.1 percent lower than those in non right to work states. So that's roughly translated. It's the difference between. Um, $23.93 per hour in non-right-to-work states compared to $20.66 per hour in right-to-work states, or about $1,558 lower, uh, lower annual in wages uh, for a typical full-time, full-year worker. Um, most importantly, the right-to-work laws prohibit unions from effectively collecting union dues, which bankrupt unions, and in so doing, um, so they significantly limit their ability to bargain effectively. Um, and without the ability for workers to effectively bargain, wages are cut, benefits are slashed, and workers have less power to protect them from unethical business practices like wage theft, misclassification of workers, and unsafe workplace practices. Uh, so if we want to invest in sustainable job growth, we need to invest in our workers' ability to organize and bargain uh, instead of workers having to rely on their own ability to negotiate contracts, the workers would rely on the unions to negotiate those same contracts and therefore give more time to the workers to focus on the project itself. Um, in some cases, developers will often treat workers as independent contractors and cut them off uh, once the project has ended. And under a union model, the workers move on from one project to another, continuing the sustained career for the workers rather than just one and done for each project. So we are working to implement um, project labor agreements across all development projects and reinstating proffers or community benefit agreements that have been scaled back here in Virginia in the past 10 years. Um, so now all, all that being said, how does that apply to the Green New Deal? Well, for unions in the long run, what is the point of a good job if there's no longer a home to come home to. Uh, right now, the renewable energy sector is growing within the United States. The rate of growth in the renewable energy sector has doubled, uh, had doubled from 2018 to 2019, going from 3% to 6%. And it's only gotten more than that, uh, more over the course of the past two years. Um, and we know if we need to combat climate change, these numbers will only increase. And we must make sure that these jobs are not only effective in combating climate change, but also paying the human element behind, uh, behind it what they are worth. Uh, unions will give our workers the necessary training that they can use to create the long lasting infrastructure to support the influx of clean, of clean energy. Um, and it is proven that when products are built with union labor, they're under budget on time and require very little maintenance and repair in the future. Uh, so we are all also are in desperate need uh, in the building of infrastructure, as we know, uh, having done, having just passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, you know, including transportation, rural broadband connectivity, 
and access to clean water. Uh, so all of the all of that being said, uh, all of these things are going to be super important when we talk about our top priorities as well. Um, so uh, that also means that we have paid sick and medical leave for all of our public and private sector workers, uh, promoting union apprenticeships for green energy, and of course prevailing wages so that no one is making below the minimum wage anymore. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to uh, Richard, who will be uh, talking about some of our uh, benefits to these bills. Richard Walker, founder and CEO of Bridging the Gap in Virginia, uh, pronouns he, him. Um, I'm excited to be here this evening because it addresses the intersectionality of uh, renewable energies. Uh, it, it expands over economic, social as well as um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, so we're at the precipice right now in the Commonwealth of Virginia and throughout the country of, of making that change to renewable energies in all areas uh, where low-income communities, uh, communities of color, uh, other areas can be covered and be included in the movement toward renewable energy. Um, I am excited uh, where it's at right now and uh, uh, through Bridging the Gap in Virginia, uh, we have been able to establish a, a green jobs workforce center in rural Buckingham County. Uh, and we are looking forward to the grand opening coming on soon. Uh, we we also have conducted what we call our solar panel installation trainings. These exposures to low income communities with these types of programs are essential for those communities to be able to be a part of the, the, the renewable energy charge. Uh, you know, I encounter individuals on a daily basis that are in need of good paying, decent wages, as well as housing. You know, and we know through renewable energy employment that these opportunities will come to those in, those low income communities that are in dire need of change. Um, I, I, we're currently right now, uh, as uh, I was one of the many of you that are on this uh, uh, live uh, broadcast that we help to turn back the Atlantic Coast pipeline. So that is part of the legislation that we need in order to stop the growth of additional fossil fuels throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have to get involved and, and maintain and stop the MVP. You know, we have to stop the Lambert. We have to stop Chickahominy. I have friends right now that are in Chatham and Pennsylvania County uh, that are looking to go to the air board and stop that you know, to continue to stop and block them from contaminating or moving forward with these compressor stations and these fossil fuels and these pipelines. You know, it is essential, it is imperative that the Commonwealth of Virginia by 2035 reach a, 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 a point where fossil fuels are no longer in the Commonwealth of Virginia, where fossil fuels and no new uh, permits be issued. We need to hold the DEQ accountable, you know, and FERC for issuing, as well as the uh, uh, Army engineers, you know, from issuing these permits that continue to disturb, destroy, and affect, adversely affect our communities. Um, until we reach that of, of moving them out, then the transition from those individuals that work in the coal mines of West Virginia, that they can be changed or develop those skills toward renewable energy. Those individuals that were being recruited by Dominion to come out to Union Hill uh, to build these pipelines, we can help transition them to renewable energy so they don't, we won't need pipe fitters anymore to build a fossil fuel uh, pipelines. This is the time, the time is now. The Green New Deal Virginia and all of its many components will allow for a more sustainable renewable energy state. At this point, I will turn it back over to Josie. Thank you, Richard. Um, I will take a quick pause here to just go over um, some questions that we have for maybe Kendall, Matt, and Richard. Um, thank you again for telling us all about our climate priorities in Virginia and why it is so important for us to act 
Now, um, let me, I guess I'll go through the election doc. Um, so there is one, what can we do to support the fight to repeal right to work? I guess it's for Matt. And then who is carrying the bill this session if we know? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, obviously we are in a little bit of a, a different situation than we were last year. Um, one, because uh, the, the person who usually carried the bill, Lee Carter, will, will no longer be in the House of Delegates. Um, but number two, we're, we're back in the minority in the House, unfortunately. Um, all, you know, the, the thing that I can really say here is that, you know, we need just to continue uh, to up the pressure as, as we have been in the past. Um, you know, this bill has been carried through minorities before. Um, it hasn't deterred anyone from putting it in. Um, last I heard, uh, it was going to be uh, carried by uh, Delegate Alfonso Lopez. Of course, that was before uh, the election. So um, whether or not the uh, leadership wants to put that back in, I'm not entirely sure. I would have to go back and check again. Um, but right now, the, the biggest thing is, you know, just to continue to lobby your delegates, um, you know, uh, it is obviously uh, it shouldn't really be a partisan issue um, trying to make sure that our workers are getting paid what they're worth. Um, you know, Republicans like to talk about how they want to support the working class and the uh, small town America folks. And these are the people that would be um, impacted and and actually lifted up by uh, repealing this law. So um, I think that we're able to kind of go to their better judgment and get some folks to support this. So I don't think that it's a lost cause, but um, just to maintain the pressure. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, definitely some new strategizing to be done for our uh, Virginia 2022. Um, I have one question for Kendall about what we can do to support um, your energy, I mean, environmental justice bill. I think that the most important thing to do to support the um, environmental justice bill um, is, you know, a couple of things. Number one, make sure that you are um, staying connected um, to the Green New Deal Coalition emails. Um, so you know kind of the, the status and where help is needed, where across the state, which legislators we need to help move and help need help educating. Um, so that's the first thing, just making sure you're staying connected. And then um, the second thing I would say is that, you know, whether you have, um, whether or not you already have, you know, it's never too late to start reaching out to your legislators, start building the relationship with them right now um, and let them know, you know, that environmental justice um, is important to you, um, that it's not a partisan issue, um, that literally <laughs> it's a basic, uh, basic human right. Yes, another issue that should be um, seen as nonpartisan. <laughs> um, I guess let me, I'll go ahead and ask at least one more question um, in relation to the MVP. And this might, you know, if you have resources uh, in terms of what we can do to take action to stop the MVP, please also share those in the chat. Um, but the question is, um, I don't really know who this should be for, maybe Richard. Um, what can we as individuals do to stop the MVP pipeline? What's going on now? I mean, I'm sure the folk that are in on, on this webinar uh, are aware that, you know, we've had folk that have sat and slept and, and stayed in the trees to stop the construction, you know, have gone to jail, you know, have been locked up have been putting their bodies in front of these uh, massive machines uh, that we have continued to fight, continue to push forward. And as it has turned out, the MVP is starting to lose its punch, you know, because they're losing in just as the ACP went down, where the monies became too much too greater that the uh, shareholders said enough is enough. You know, uh, if we get to our legislators to the, the stop the uh, 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 destruction and the erosion that is taking place the, uh, throughout the lands that they're trying to uh, uh, put these pipelines through, 
You know, it's the same process as the ACP. And all of my environmental friends have pushed forward to, it, to, to halt, to stop, to prolong it, to push it out, to make sure that they get to legislators to tell them that this must end. You know, that the MVP must not go forward. Thank you, Richard. And as I'm sure you all saw in the chat, there is a vigil, a no MVP vigil on December 11th um, at Dogwood, Dogwood Dell um, from 1 to 3 p.m. in Richmond. So that's a great way to get involved, stop and finally kill the MVP. Um, I think with that, since it's already 7.30, we'll go ahead and move on to talking uh, more in depth about the new Virginia Economy Act. Um, to get us started with this, we're gonna have Stacy, the chair of our DEER committee, um, introduce us. Go Thanks, ahead, Stacy. thank you. Thanks, and thank you, um, Richard, Matt, and Kendall as well for speaking. Um, hi, y'all. I'm Stacey Lovelace. I'm the chair of the Defossilization, Energy Efficiency, and Renewables Working Group for the Coalition, which we also call DEER. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am in the unceded territory of the Sipponi, Tutelo, and Monacan nations. Um, so I will give a recap of our top priorities um, that will be covered in our bills. The first and overarching priority is a transition to truly clean renewable energy by um, 2035, and that's for our electricity, and it's making it a just transition. And so that'll include a fossil fuel moratorium. Um, like Richard said, we have to stop all the build out of new fossil fuel infrastructure and these harmful projects that are um, hurting communities. We also need to strengthen our energy efficiency goals. Um, and throughout this entire transition, we need to have a climate action plan um, that is developed by impacted communities, workers, everybody that has a stake in this transition um, to ensure that no community is left behind and that we have protections for workers and vulnerable communities um, to ensure that the transition is just. And um, you heard from Matt and Kendall on those protections and Richard as well on the um, programs and protections and mandates to um, ensure that getting to that 100% by 2035, no community is left behind or harmed by it. Um, and, and to do so, we have um, two bills this year, the New Virginia Economy Act, which um, is being carried by Delegate Sam Rizul, and then also a standalone fossil fuel moratorium bill that will still have workers and community, um, worker and community protections in it. Um, and that's a recap of our top priorities. And now I will pass it to Delegate Rizul to expand on the New Virginia Economy Act. Well, good evening, everyone. It is great to see a bunch of rap browsers uh, together here this evening uh, and thank you for continuing to invest your time and energy into a, a worthy cause of building broad coalitions. Um, my job is to talk a little bit about the bill and I'll mention one or two points but what I really want to share um, is what's on my heart is um, you know this election that we saw uh, a month ago today uh, was really a, a testament to um, a, a lack of vision in how we can um, get behind big, bold ideas, build broad coalitions, speak to so many people and bring them into our big tent and meet people where they're at. And I hope that we will uh, do everything that we can to collectively um, learn from this, uh, uh, you know, this step back, I think, for Virginia. Uh, so that way it, it never happens again. Uh, and uh, for me, you know, to um, have gone through and worked, we, we all worked so hard to build a majority, to build uh, what we thought is a, a, a governing structure that can um, make some progress. Um, and, and now we are actually one vote away, one vote in the Senate away 
from making uh, a step, from taking further steps backwards. Uh, and, and to me, it is, it is um, uh, a, a great lesson for us to learn as we move forward, because we always do keep an eye to the future and think about um, uh, what we uh, should and, and can be doing. And it begins with this type of coalition work that is so important. Uh, and, and right now is an, is an opportunity. I have spoken with uh, a variety of different folks. And when um, you know, there were Democratic majorities, uh, it, was, it was a little bit different. Maybe we were in, in a variety of different factions as you had people pushing one uh, policy here, one policy there. Uh, but now is actually an opportunity for us to even uh, grow our coalition broader, where we can go to some folks, for example, who were uh, pushing the Clean Economy Act that, that I was personally against, but their heart was in the right place and say, hey, uh, we have some work to do together uh, to play some defense and to see if we can make some, some progress. So we look for, we search out, and we dig down deep into uh, the opportunities, e even in uh, this loss that we had uh, last month, and, and utilize this opportunity to build our coalitions stronger than ever. And now is a great time to do it. This is the beauty of uh, the Green New Deal Coalition and the organizations that are represented here. Um, and as we talk about the uh, New Virginia uh, Economy Act, um, you know, it's there are many, many pages to a draft that I have that we are still working through. You've seen, you've heard of uh, many of the, the pieces, whether it be the moratorium and a clear moratorium that we end the building of new fossil fuel infrastructures. So we're not, you know, tonight, right now, there are people in, in, in Chatham, and I, I wish I could be there with them, who are speaking to the um, air board, trying to stop a permit. You know, we should, this shouldn't even be a question, <clears throat> especially right now at this moment, there are democratic majorities, right? We have a democratic trifecta and here we are. Um, uh, we need to say, hey, if you're gonna be an environmentalist, there's, there's not no softball here that, uh, yeah, I, I, I recycle every once in a while. No, we have got to take a, a firm stand uh, on this once and for all. And the, the New Virginia Economy Act brings in all of these, these pieces, a comprehensive climate action plan, a real honest uh, moratorium, a just transition for workers, including putting funding uh, behind that, thinking through what real energy efficiency goals uh, can be like with a, a more aggressive uh, strategy as that is low lying fruit. And now we have um, seen more and more data just this past year about how methane is a really a lower lying fruit here uh, in limiting the, the methane emissions in battling uh, against uh, climate change. And, uh, and one important piece here is also for me, challenging the predatory accounting uh, by Dominion Energy, uh, which is at the core of this economic and social justice. You know, we got all the justices going on right here. And, and, and for the first time, in modern Virginia history, we saw uh, a, a gubernatorial candidate win without the support of Dominion. And uh, the Democratic side, with the full support of Dominion, lost. What does that tell us? We are on the losing side uh, if we're continuing to back uh, and, and welcome the support of these interests that are not putting us front and center, whether it be economic, environmental, or social justice. It all has to come together. That's what these bills do. And, and look, I know uh, it, it is tough. It is tough out there. And you're uh, trying to figure out where do I find the energy? And many of you have heard me say this over and over again, that I had some friends give me a pair of boxing gloves, which I keep hanging in my office. And it was a reminder of a wonderful speech that we heard uh, where this uh, African-American judge told us that we must punch holes in darkness. And we don't let the cynicism of this uh, industry uh, that is politics get us down. Uh, we know what our jobs are, that we are keeping uh, those, uh, those holes going uh, as we punch holes in darkness together. And we bring that little bit of light, uh, but sometimes that's all you need is a spark. And that's what I see here. 
Uh, so count me in. Um, we've been there from the beginning and we're going to do everything that we can to not only push a moratorium, the new Virginia uh, Economy Act, but to stop the Mountain Valley pipeline. Because when we started on this struggle years ago, we said that we, we, when we were pushing back against the pipelines, we wanted to stop both pipelines. We wanted to make sure that no candidate on the Democratic side ran a pro-pipeline uh, agenda and that we would give them, give these companies so much hell that the, no other company would want to come through Virginia again. And that is mm -hmm. happening. Uh, like Richard said, uh, you all have done so much uh, to help us out. So let me know how I can help uh, anytime and can't wait to make some more progress and see what opportunities we can capitalize on in the coming session. Thank you so much, Delegate Rizul. Do you have some time for questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Sure, sure. Wonderful. Um, all right, let me see. Well, there's one that, which I feel like you might have just answered a little bit, but what gives you hope as we face um, some new barriers in this upcoming session? Mm. You know, when I came in in 2014, I, the, uh, I was in a special election. So I got there and I was elected and the next day I needed to be in session. And, you know, I'm one of these dorks. I'm like reading through the bills and love to see the information. And um, two weeks in, I get this, this thick bill and I start reading through it. And it was an energy bill. And it took me a week to figure out what it said. You know, I'm not an attorney. It took me a week. I went to the State Corporation Commission. I went to many folks and I finally figured it out. And I, I, I asked some questions and they, were, and they kind of grinned like, hey, you figured out the jackpot here. And it was a Dominion bill. And I, I said, man, there are some bad parts. They're about to steal half a billion dollars. And, uh, and they did. It ended up passing. Steal half a billion dollars from ratepayers. I went back to my caucus and I was like a kid in a candy store. I'm like, oh yeah, hey guys, I just want everybody to know. I just found something, you know? And it was crickets. No Republican uh, uh, for the most part, except for one. And, and the, none of the Democrats had anything to say about this. And I, I think back to that. And then I think to where we're at today that we have um, uh, many delegates who are open and pushing back against these interests, whether it be fossil fuel utilities, pushing for uh, these types of significant reforms, some bright, awesome new talent. And, you know, it's certainly, while it's tough to see sometimes, uh, you know, going year to year, we have made some progress. And when they scoffed at me, when I said, I'm not going to be taking any uh, PAC donations. Um, now, almost every candidate that runs has some kind of pledge, right? That they say, I, I'm going to, on principle, you know, limit the types of donations that I accept. Uh, and I think that this is a testament to how things are moving along uh, for the better. Not enough, not fast enough, um, but progress is being made. And so uh, let's continue to think uh, longer term and, and, uh, and try to support some of those new folks like Nadarius Clark and the Sally Hudson's and, uh, and some others who, who we know uh, can be strong talents uh, on the side of good here. Uh, and at the same time, try to, try to grow that coalition. So that's what gives me um, hope even in some difficult times. Thank you. Yeah, here's to punching holes in the darkness. Um, I have a slightly more uh, technical question for you about the new Virginia Economy Act, but um, what would you say to people who are going to ask how we are going to pay for this kind of bill? What oh, is the plan that for is, that? I love it. Well, this bill, after the passing of the Clean Economy Act, we might even save some money. Um, so uh, you, 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 uh, you can be very, very direct and you can say, hey, the past couple bills that we passed around clean energy have said that Dominion can make, you know, enormous billions. Um, we're, we're not even, um, um, you know, being 
uh, we're not even stretching the truth here, they can make billions of extra profit uh, with the current bills. And we want to repeal some of that, right? And we want to make sure that it is, in fact, a just transition. Many of you saw just a few weeks ago, Dominion announced, oh, by the way, these windmills that we're building, we said they were 8 billion, now they're 10 billion, right? Um, and, and so they, they actually can, can go up to 14 billion approximately and nobody can stop them. Uh, and, 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 and it's not that they're building more wind capacity, it's that they make money when they own expensive stuff. So they want stuff to be very expensive because their accounting is just different than regular companies. So when somebody asks you, how are we gonna pay for this? You're gonna look them in the eye and say, we believe in a just transition and some of these bills that have allowed for Dominion to make records amount of money, we wanna peel that back and make sure these investments are working in the best interest of Virginians. I like that. That sounds pretty good to me. Um, I'm just gonna hold off for a moment and see if just anybody on the call has a question that they wanna ask. Um, Delegate Rizul. Okay, if you don't, I have a few more. Um, we I, have one, one hand up, I believe. Oh, yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, hi, Sam, this is Majula Amber, how are you? I'm well, my friend from the peninsula, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. Thank you so much for that inspirational um, insight into how you're going to get this passed. Um, I just want to ask you, given the change of um, the leadership, uh, where, where do you see the, the center of gravity in the Republican party and the governor in terms of climate? Uh, do, are they even willing to keep the little progress we have made with the Green Economy Act? And then of course, we want to go towards um, more of what you're talking about, the Green New Deal. So can you give us a little more practical sense of where things are in Richmond and what's the immediate strategy uh, to influence Republicans too? And, and tell us what can we do? Of course, we want the ultimate, but I'm more of a pragmatist. I'm asking you that way. What can we do not to lose the progress we made at the same time, keep making more progress? Thank you. Yeah, no, I think um, great, great question. And it is important to be tactical uh, in our, our approach and to be thinking through what can happen. So first, yes, we will be playing some defense. Um, this is just the, the reality uh, to ensure that some of the progress we have made, um, separate from the Clean Economy Act, we passed many bills, that we, we need to ensure that it's working in our best interest. Uh, second, um, you know, we have some common ground with folks um, and some Republicans on uh, the, the dominion abuses of their accounting. And there are um, several Republicans, many Republicans who believe that uh, we have got to um, stand up once and for all. And with Dominion putting their, their thumb on the scale so heavily for, for Democrats um, in, in this past election, maybe there's an even increased appetite, um, who, who knows? Uh, but we'll, we'll see if we can work together to tighten up those regulations. Um, and, and I know that you know, this is at the core of what several uh, Republicans believe as well. And so if we can corral all the Democrats and get some Republicans, maybe <clears throat> there can be some progress uh, made there. Um, third, you know, when we talk about uh, a just transition, uh, when we can be innovative and, and think through uh, new ideas like regenerative agriculture, which helps farmers gets more nutritious food to us, creates um, uh, jobs, um, and is a, a important for carbon sequestration, you can begin to approach you know, these win-win um, situations. And, and I'll tell you some areas in deep Southwest Virginia, uh, they kind of could care less about you know, some of the conversations going back and forth. They are desperate for growth and development and, um, and wanting to, reclaim mines and find other innovative ways. 
And so I think that there'll be some, some room uh, for progress. So there is uh, uh, some room, uh, however small it may be, there is some room for progress. However, one of the most important pieces of progress we can make is to grow our coalition, is to go to um, people, especially our union brothers and sisters, <clears throat> to grow to some of these other entities where you know, maybe uh, we might have had a, a difference of opinion on, on certain things, but we clearly can go less around some things now. Um, so that way you're building for decisions that are made in 2022, but in 2023 and 2024. I mean, this is how uh, we can make the, that, real, uh, that real progress. So thank you for your question. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Just we have time for one more question if somebody else has something they'd like to ask. Prue, go ahead. Hi, I, I'm my question is, and maybe I misunderstood what you said, Delegate Russell, but I, I thought I heard you say that you were personally against the Clean Economy Act. Mm hmm. Okay, could you tell me why I I'm, would like to yeah. know? Thank you. No, it's a, it's a great question. So first, what the Clean Economy Act did was make some modest progress on several environmental goals. Um, while many of us would have liked to uh, have seen more done on in, um, energy efficiency and a few other things, we, we did make some environmental progress. However, in uh, this space, we talk about intersectional justice. In other words, we have to think about the social, environmental, economic justice uh, together. What the Clean Economy Act did was unjustly say we're going to significantly enrich Dominion and allow the, uh, in order to allow these policies to move forward. So the legislature was hijacked, um, but you know, to me, we're the regulators. You know, we're the ones that come in and say, this is how things should, should play out. And sadly, you know, we had uh, almost all Democrats and then in the end, a couple of Republicans who um, would not agree to, to changes to make this a more just process. And now, and uh, now to speak objectively, um, the uh, what happened was there was a subsequent analysis after it, it, it passed by the State Corporation Commission, which showed that it in fact was going to be worse economically for people um, than we anticipated. And again, we all agree that we will need to pay something. We'll need to pay more to battle uh, climate change, but it must be just and it must not be um, stealing billions of dollars from uh, Virginians. That is fundamentally wrong uh, for us to allow that to, to happen. And so that's why um, a couple of us uh, uh, on the Democratic side uh, were fighting uh, tooth and nail to, to try to make some changes to the very end, um, but they were having none of it, sadly. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and so to put this in context, uh, now as we move forward, there will be provisions from the VCEA that will come under attack. And it will be important for us, for some of those provisions, to be defending them. Because uh, they will be, um, depending on how the bills are, uh, some of that we, we will have to be defending, for example, the modest gains we made in energy efficiency. Uh, now, with the new Virginia Economy Act, we want to push that much harder, but um, we certainly don't want to go backwards. And, and, and so we, we, we're going to be smart about it, uh, and we'll take it one bill at a time and see what the, uh, the Republicans are, are, are proposing here. Uh, and that's why we have an opportunity to build you know, broader coalitions. Thank you. I actually have one more question in the chat um, from Russ Hopler. It's a great question. Um, how can other Congress or members help you more and members of your um, Virginia delegates? And what can we ask of your peers that represent us to support you more? So what, what I think that the main thing uh, that we want to, to focus on um, in the coming weeks is 
uh, what you are doing here. The, the theme tonight was mobilize. Um, uh, trust me, when people from your district are approaching you about issues, it gets their attention. You know, sadly, because apathy tends to be high, um, and it might even be a little higher uh, going into this year because of the election results. You know, if, if you have 20 people from someone's district who contact them, especially if they do it, you know, by phone or in person, um, you have their attention and you can help to hold people more accountable. Uh, and, and I think that um, uh, you uh, ensuring that um, you, you open up that line of communication on behalf of the coalition or your um, the coalition and your organizations. Uh, I know you, we heard from our, our awesome friend Kendall here, who um, uh, is uh, you know, at Interfaith Power Line is doing some great work. And we have many others. Uh, let's make sure that they hear us. And so that way they know at least that there are repercussions. Um, well, I have seen just through some of our work uh, in, and, and, and this is not embellishing at all, you know, cert, uh, one year, certain Democrats pushing extremely hard, I shouldn't say Democrats, I should say legislators, but it is true, it's Democrat, pushing extremely hard for pro-Dominion legislation, feeling so much heat that the next year carrying anti-Dominion legislation. Um, that is a testament to the, the broader coalition coming together and saying, hey, we are watching. We're going to hold people accountable. And some of it may be honest, just education of legislators uh, who may feel as though that they're doing the, the right thing. And, and you've educated them. And, and so I think there are a lot of well-intentioned people in the legislature. Uh, we just need to, to engage. So hopefully you'll continue to do that, Russ and, and company. Thank you so much. Um, before we close off for tonight, I actually, you know, speaking of mobilizing, we do have some things that you can do to get the New Virginia Economy Act through um, the next upcoming session. So one of them is a call to action tool that I just put in the chat. Um, this is one where you can email your Virginia House of Delegate and Virginia Senate members and tweet at them. Um, closer to session, we will update it and add a click to call button as well. This is a very easy and simple way to let your representatives know that you care about the new Virginia Economy Act and you want them to take action on climate. Um, you can also share this with your lists. We have, when you take action, you can share it on Facebook, Twitter, and via email. Um, and then, also, we invite you to please save the date for January 12th at 10 a.m. We are going to be having a rally outside the Capitol and an advocacy day going to our legislators' offices and speaking to them in person about the importance of climate action in Virginia. Um, we, if you aren't able to get the link now, that's okay. We will send it to you in a follow-up email, um, but it's super easy and a great way to just get started and start reminding your legislators about the work that they need to do in the upcoming session. Um, and with that, we have three extra minutes of your day. Thank you so much for being here tonight and learning about how you can mobilize. Thank you again, Delegate Rizul, for telling us so much about the New Virginia Economy Act. Um, and yeah, thank you. Have a good night and stay safe, everyone.